Okay. So, um, so I do think I'm always surprised actually by, it seems to me Lion students don't think a lot about political things. And that's uh, worrisome because there's so much polarization. And so in order to avoid polarization, you have to sort of be informed enough to know that, wait, step back. Um, and the polarization, again, is based on some corruption of the imagination, you know, what people think they're seeing when they look out at the world, and also their arguments, what arguments they've learned that reinforce that image that they have. Um, so for example, I didn't think I was biased, right? I, my dad marched with Martin Luther King in Selma and I did a long paper in high school on the civil rights movement. I read a lot of really big books, uh, Malcolm X and Claude Brown and Martin Luther King and all a lot of stuff, honestly. But I, there were no books up uh, by for and about African American women. They just didn't exist yet. And so when I started reading those books, I realized I had a stereotype in my head of the, the African American woman in the ghetto with lots of kids and overwhelmed. And I felt sorry for her, right? You know, she's overwhelmed. She needs, we need programs, but still like, <laughs> That's not true. They were strong, strong women, right? And they were the bulwarks of their families and they were the ones that kept the family together and they were incredibly strong in the face of adversity. And so now because of that, there are so many successful African-American women. And when Black Lives Matter happened, um, there, I mean, I still think that we haven't made nearly enough progress and I think it's awful and now there's a backlash and actually the next election might be determined by that backlash. Nobody's gonna make my kid read books that make me feel bad about myself, you know? That, ugh, that's those culture war things. It's just the same old, same old of what's happened before these backlashes. And so it's disturbing, but the commentators, the news that I get, there were so many interviews with uh, African-Americans who are Congress people at the national and the state level, governors, mayors of big cities like Atlanta. Um, and a lot of them are women intellectuals, PhDs, teaching at Princeton. And, you know, it was, that was heartening, right? It's way, way, you know, it just didn't happen when I was your age. Very, very few. But now, you know, a lot of people have made inroads. It's just that we also have this backlash and it just drives me nuts. There's no need for it, you know? Like, what's the point? But, okay, that's my two bits from somebody who's looked at it for 50 years, you guys, 50 years. It's where are we gonna be 50 years from now, you know, when you're my age? That's what I wanna know. Like, how much progress will we have made? Um, and I think there's also the question of, are we gonna progress faster on sexual orientation? Which is very possible because there's, because they non-binary people um, can hide, right? And they can succeed. And it's just, you know, the African-Americans in our country the descendants of slaves, it's just really hard. You know, they're stuck in these ghettos because, not because they're lazy or bad, because they were not given housing. 
And that's just been a huge, huge problem. Anyway, so let's go to the paper topics. Um, anyway, thank you, Melanie, for um, the story. And I hope, you know, it was worthwhile to just, you know, read a long explanation of one biblical story so that you understand that there are scholars who have examined everything in the Bible in that close way. And so it's not a matter of just everything in the Bible is inerrant and straight from God, or else I don't want anything to do with religion. Just get it out of my life. <laughs> right? I mean, remember those uh, humanists that were so anti-religion and they just said, this is from the Stone Age, like it's Stone Age thinking, you know, get it out of here. We don't need it. Um, or on the other hand, um, you know, whatever the Bible says is true and those humanists are rotten and degenerate and all that other stuff. There's just no way that that's true. So I hope, I hope, you know, you learn that that's a lesson you can learn. Um, from the class. All right, so here we go. You need to discuss Aristotle's political virtues. That's, it's very important. So you get in the habit of thinking like this, right? You might want to also include some of the personal and social virtues. Um, how do you want to incorporate political virtues into your life and your worldview, right? Um, what do you think it means to be an educated citizen, an informed citizen? And per, I can tell you, I think it's possible to spend too much time looking at news. And I think I might have been guilty of that uh, the last four years. And I have to sort of stop myself um, because, you know, the world needs me to be doing other things than just, than just finding out uh, that stuff. I really need to engage with what I think I can contribute. And that's the big question for all of you. Like, what's the way I can take the talents I have and the opportunities and, you know, live not just, I mean, partly your career, the best contribution, but partly after work, right? There's so many ways people get engaged in public life. And I admire all of them, right? They do coaching or Girl Scouts or Boy Scouts or um, church groups, uh, all sorts of clubs. Americans are totally club people. All that stuff is good. And it helps bind people together. And that's what makes for democracy. So um, I just, I want to encourage you to, to keep, keep working at it, um, keep thinking about that. And that's at Lion, you have all these clubs, right? To just get you started thinking about what you can do. Um, all right. Okay, within the community, all right. And the, the issues are how to make good laws, how to distribute social goods like education and wealth, honor, uh, health care, the rectifying wrongs, criminal justice, uh, the judges that apply the laws, and then the enforcement, and economic exchange, right? Money and banking. Um, so let's see, Jesus, Socrates, Martin Luther King, or some other person, and how they actually manifested in their way of life the Aristotelian virtues. Um, and is there, so Martin Luther King, I argued is a Christian humanist, but he refers to Socrates, right? He actually embodies Aristotelian virtues. He doesn't refer to Aristotle, but he embodies them. Um, and then his relationship to the status quo is that he questioned the status quo for the reason that he argued the status quo is contradicting universal law, natural law, right? 
So he has a standard against which you can criticize your own country's laws. So blind obedience to your country's norms or laws is not going to preserve a democracy. So Western democracy or any democracy requires learning about universal uh, laws or patterns. Racism all over the world is wrong, right? Sexism all over the world. Gender, you know, sexual orientation, discrimination. So how are we going to get from where we are all over the world to a better place? Um, then you have our Aristotle and management. So uh, students have used this to talk about their coaches or their employers or um, their teachers. Um, or you could talk about it in terms of what kind of a leader you anticipate that you want to be. Um, it could be somebody at Lyon, right? I know that a lot of the students at Lyon often develop a close relationship with people on the staff because the staff is really nice and they're here because they want to be here. I lived on campus for seven years. So I know that a lot, for a lot of students, the staff are role, role models or coaches and staff are role models more than the professors are. Most of the professors don't know that because they didn't live on campus. But I know that and it's humbling, but you know, Everybody needs role models wherever they come from. And then you can explain why, right? Why this person is a role model for you. Um, okay. What sort of a climate does the leader create within the institution? That's sort of the main art of leadership is creating a climate in the institution. Um, what about women's rights? So you can write about women's rights or you can write about uh, race, equality or gender, right? Sexual orientation. Um, then you can write on the United Nations if you want to. Economic development, the development of a equal, more egalitarian global economic system because right now we have a very, very work uh, economic system within the US and then in the world. Um, if you want to look up some of the UN's um, programs, uh, the way it works, um, I recommend it because, again, I my dad took me to the UN, I don't know, I guess it was in junior high, and the head, the, the person who was the, uh, what, the leader of it, what's it called? The general, Sergeant General or something. Um, the second one in the history of the UN was actually Swedish and my father's Swedish. So I found out about Doc Hammarskjöld, you know? But anyway, the UN was always a positive thing in my mind. And I know when a lot of Lion students, they don't know anything about it or during the Bush administration, they hated it, okay? It was the Antichrist. I had kids who were told the UN is the Antichrist. It's like, what? But um, anyway, they have a lot of good programs, really good programs for um, international healthcare. So uh, for example, I was on a Fulbright. So there was a woman who teaches nursing in the US and she got a Fulbright to go to Indonesia and start um, a, U a UN program for nursing. So the UN has this universal program for the courses you need to take to get a nursing degree. And so it's standardized all over the world. And that is so helpful for developing countries. So they don't have to like recreate the wheel like they don't have to do it all themselves. The UN comes in there and they, this is the program. It works. You end up with a trained nurse. And then, of course, they can, uh, people can apply for these jobs who have learned how to teach this course or that course. People from all over the world, the more developed countries, can come in, fill in the slot, and get the program going. 
And I mean, that's incredible. And then the UN also, um, it has these world historical sites that it protects and supports economically. So a lot of the world's most important natural and cultural sites are in countries that are too poor to actually keep them up, preserve them. And so the UN will do that. Oh, there's way more than that, but um, don't let anybody tell you the UN is bad just because it can't stop wars. It can't stop wars because a country like the United States won't listen to them. <laughs> It's not their fault. Um, anyway, right now the UN is meeting, okay, because of what's going on in the Ukraine and Russia. And um, the head of the Ukraine spoke via, you know, online, via Zoom or whatever, to the United Nations Secure, um, General Assembly. The UN, another thing about the UN is that Every country in the world has a representative. And at the General Assembly, everybody gets to vote. One country, one vote. And for many, many countries, the front page news every day is what's going on at the UN, because this is their way to participate in, um, in global issues. Otherwise, they'd be totally isolated. So the UN is their link to the world's culture and civilization and events and also protections and support. So um, anyway, I'm just a great fan. And if you wanted to do some research, it's very humanistic, right? It is the world's humanistic um, uh, organization. And it has that capabilities model of development which I had in the beginning of my paper on women's rights. So anyway, that's my little spiel about the UN. Then there's the virtue of an educated voter. This is really, really important. Um, and we, the article was about the importance of education ever since our founding, and that there were always people that cared more about money than paying taxes for education. And there were always politicians that would say, if you vote for me, I won't make you pay taxes. And so the educational system just didn't get off the ground. Also, the South got way behind the North. It got 50 years behind because the New York, the, you know, New York and these other Northern countries, because they were moving toward industrial based economies, they needed more education for their citizens. So they got ahead of the loop and the South is still behind, you know? Um, so then we need to revive the founder's definition of, of education as a public good, right? It's essential pillar of government. It's not a private achievement that if you make enough money, you can send your kid to college. That makes it competitive and adversarial. And what that does is the people who already have money can get their kids the education where they'll make money, right? And the people who already don't have it can't give their kid the education. And so you have this split. So the middle class shrinks and you can't have a democracy without a middle class. So that making education, you know, an economic achievement is really a mistake it will destroy the middle class. But if we think of it as a public good and we're willing to pay for it, then we can have a middle class. Um, the concept of virtue, again, it's, it's funny that that guy says we don't have a common one. I say, yes, we do, it's Aristotle. <laughs> but it's this ability to transcend your diverse interests in favor of the common good. And we have politicians now that call that socialism and it's fat, you know, it's government control. And he quotes some of this stuff where politicians are demonizing public education. And when they do that, all it does is the quality of it goes down because there's no money for it. And also because there's no monitoring of it. 
So this is really important. I, I mean, I hope that you understand that because your lives, you know your life is affected by the educational system. And so I want you to realize that all the ways that your life has been affected by it is also true of every other aspect of your life. You just haven't been aware of it. Like the banking system will affect you. The um, land use system, environmental protections will affect you, does affect you, but you'll start to become more aware of it as you go into adult life. Every aspect of life is affected by political issues, whether there are good laws, whether they're enforced well, whether the people know what they're doing, whether they're purposely uh, abusing their power and all this, all this stuff, it's all very important. And it's trying to give you a different image in the back of your mind of what culture is all about. Then we have those humanist manifestos. Um, how do they, do they or do they not fit with Aristotle's virtues? So do you think Aristotle's virtues can be used as a bridge between religious humanists, spiritual humanists, secular humanists, ancient humanists, modern humanists, Renaissance humanists, African-American, you know, <laughs> you name it. So if you wanted to write about that a little bit, that would be fine. Um, Okay, this one is about, um, let's see, to explain how you want to incorporate the virtues into every aspect of your life, right? If you wanna just take a step back and think about it, not just personal, but political. So you start to see the relationship between personal and political. Um, Let's see, I had a student, gosh, I don't think I'm gonna be able to find it, but I had a student who sent me a paper about the relation between personal and political. Usually I have it lying around, but she said um, she was in the car with her grandparents and they said, um, you know, if Hitler had won, we wouldn't have to deal with all these gays and Muslims and all this stuff. Or she was at the state fair or something and someone in a burqa walked by and her grandma says, how much do you bet she has a gun underneath her burqa? You know? and, then, and then another one's grandma was, has been triggered by 9-11, ever since 9-11. She has a diagnosed uh, phobia, right? but she carries around a gun. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. So do I feel safer? Cause her grandma who has a disorder uh, has a gun. <laughs> I don't think so. But anyway, the point there is that these personal issues become political and they also make her depressed, right? If they upset her. And so, um, there is really no gap between the personal and political. The way you live affects political life. It affects our health, obviously health. What we eat and exercise has really got a tremendous impact on our deficit, on our um, spending, on the well-being of our society. Okay, so Mulek, this was a number of years ago. Um, but there had been a lot of discord for a while. And he came out with a statement about um, unity. The goal of the rally is to declare the community won't resort to violence. Okay, that we're gonna do community building. The thing is, things have gotten worse since then. We're even more polarized than we were then. But, um, so I do want you to think, you could write a paper on whether you think Aristotle is a good model to overcome the polarization that plagues us right now. <coughs> okay. Um, you could go back to the tippet on stress and depression because I didn't have that in the paper topics the first time. 
but you'd have to link it to social and political stuff. Um, so I was talking to another student who's uh, a non-traditional student, and she's been trying to juggle raising kids and staying in school and developing a career, which I also did in my 20s. And, and we both agreed, right? I figured this out after a while. The society is driving me crazy. Like, I'm not crazy. It's not my problem. It's the way the society is structured that is designed to make life for a woman who wants to juggle career and family absolutely impossible. So if we're normal, what we want is rational. We're going to go crazy. And so, <laughs> so you want to figure out what is the connection between our psychological health and the health that, well, you know, the, whether the societies we live in are well-structured. So if it's structured in a way that you can't win, it's not your fault for getting depressed or angry. <laughs> and so you should think about all of that. We went through that with uh, unjust suffering. So you could go back to that uh, sheet about unjust suffering and how racism and classism and sexism are the cause of a lot of unjust suffering. Um, that humanism and anti-humanism, oh, sorry, please jot down notes. I told you I'd stop every once in a while. But anyway, we had a good debate about that. And you could re write more about that if you want to, the culture wars, because that is definitely going to come up. It's going to be a major issue in the next election, the humanism versus anti-humanism. Um, and what about COVID-19? Um, what do you think Alan Taylor would say about whether we're an educated, we're educated voters and we're handling it in an educated way? <laughs> okay, so um, Alex, what do you want to react to? Uh, well, there were several that had caught my attention. Um, well, for one, I wanted to um, write about like issues of like, oh, sorry, um, polarization within the LGBTQ oh, okay. plus community. Okay. Um, that or my personal experiences with COVID-19 uh, and the polarization that had like that formed between communities because of COVID-19 um, because I had personal experiences with it. Um, it I mean it happened within my family like um, my uh, grandfather died because of COVID-19 and um, the, the the tension and polarization that came with that. Um, uh, there's another one. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't stop. Oh, it's not, it's no problem. Um, that and um, you had given the example of Dr. Mulek uh, and his his uh, response to, uh, to 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 the happenings of the world. I was considering maybe writing about the um, issue of last semester with uh, former President King. Oh. And um, yeah, and and the issues that came from that within the community in Batesville. So that was that one was those three were um, interesting to me. Very good. I mean, I'd love to find out how students reacted to the whole King thing. Again, I'm here in Minnesota um, and I, I get sometimes I want to be on campus more. I think I'm going to come like three weeks for three weeks in the spring um, because I miss it. You know, I like my students. And so then I'll have more time to talk to you when, I, you know, it'll be nice. But anyway, yeah, come to think of it, I never did get a chance to talk to students about that. Um, okay, good. 
and and even whatever you write about Alex, when I'm there, you come into my office and we'll chat. Okay. Okay. Melanie, what about you? Um, I was really interested in the first topic about like comparing Jesus, Socrates, um, Aristotle, and Martin Luther King. I think that would be really interesting because I I think they're all kind of their morals line up with humanism to an extent, um, but it's all different ways. They all have different morals within that um, that makes their humanism and their leadership different. I think it'd be cool to compare and contrast that. Um, and then also the um, educated voter. I think um, like including the actual definition of what education is and then giving my definition, um, that would be cool to co contrast um, because education is so much more than just intelligence you learn from a book. It's experiences and things you learn through actual life. And um, I would also include in that how our founders would think of us and how the world is run now. <laughs> yeah. Um, every single one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, unified reason and faith. Every one. And now over half of Americans do not. Okay? Like we are a totally different country. And that spooks me out. Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes, yeah, that, I think it'd be really interesting to write on and get all of the facts. <laughs> okay, um, the other thing, yeah, if you want to ask me, I might know some stuff, but I also think it's a really good exercise for someone like you that's transitioning from the Catholic school to being a humanist, because then, you know, in your mind or for people you can point out, you know, I'm not a bad person because I'm dissociating <laughs> with, with my Catholic upbringing, right? Yeah. Um, okay, my, I myself have my Catholic nun friends that I just love, but they're not at all strict or um, exclusionary, right? They like Buddhism and Hinduism and they don't, they're very ecumenical. And uh, someday, if you come to visit me, I'll introduce you to them. But anyway, um, it, I, when, I, I, when I was your age, I sorted through all that stuff, too. And I do think for people for whom this is a button, <laughs> it is really satisfying to sort through that, because then you have the reasons, right? And you can cut through the way people you know, present themselves, they create themselves as a brand, like their religion is a brand, rather than a way of life, right? Does that make sense, Melanie? Yes, that's also why I think um, religion has kind of become so corrupt in areas like government, because when people are getting elected, yeah, they make it their brand, basically, you know, if you know, if you vote for me, God's going to love you or you're, you know, things like that. Not only that, but the ones that won't bring in religion then are demonized as atheists, right? And really, yeah. the reason they don't bring it in is exactly the reason our founders did not want them to bring it in, right? But yeah, like, so they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. And they don't, right? But they get Dan for it. <laughs> anyway, so it's all good. Um, I do think I probably talk too much because I think uh, both of you have a lot to say. But um, make sure to meet with me while you're doing your outline. Like, make sure to start your outlines and then we can expand them or whatever. And it's not due for a long time. It's not due till March 17th because I wanna give you all a chance to, um, to stagger your work so that you, I mean, it's, it's your responsibility 
to stagger your work. And it's not that you had bad luck and you have three papers due on one day, right? That's why I try to give you a, a time. Um, but it's always to your advantage to write it earlier because it's in your mind, right? But it's up to you anyway. Stop talking, Dr. Beck. Time to go. <laughs> anyway, I love my students. I hope you know that. Um, take care. Bye, Dr. Beck. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Beck. Of course.